This is Kickin' Ass Taking Names Podcast, and today we're here with a very special guest, Mr. Princeton Clark. Princeton, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, me. And I know that uh, originally we had an episode, um, and you know we had some logistical errors, but now we're able to shoot this, so I'm really excited to have you here. Um, I know that also you've got a couple of books uh, that you've written. Mm -hmm. So, um, Awakening Your Inner Master and Warrior of Love, Speaker of Truth, yeah. right? Right. And um, so, you know, for the audience, um, you know, you're a coach, you're a mentor, you're an author, but how do you define yourself and what got you into that space? Oh, man. <laughs> this is where we rewind. You know, like a lot of times we hear the accolades, we hear the results, but I always say but behind every great person or every great goal achieved, there was a great challenge. And for me, that challenge happened around the age of 23. Well, I'll say er my entire early life, I faced a lot of challenges and I'll try to condense it for those out there in podcast land. But I was abused as a kid, molested, you know, dealt with a lot growing up, deep depression and barely graduated high school. I was a tremendous athlete, but growing up in the wrong environment, which is ultimately what I really focus on now, helping people understand the environments that they put themselves in, mm -hmm. whether they can control it or not, you know, as we become adults, the different environments, the way they affect us. But I didn't always have a positive environment or, or a lot of positive reinforcement growing up. So I ended up barely graduating high school. And I grew up in an area where most people who were born there die there, you know? Right. I can go back there now and still see people that I've known since I was a little kid who've never left that area. And I knew as a kid, I was like, I'm not going to stay here. I don't know what I got to go through, what I have to experience. But I thought, you know, getting involved with gangs and drugs and all that stuff, like that was going to be my way out. I'm going to make, you know, the hustler's dream. Like I'm going to make, I'm going to sell enough drugs. and I'm going to get out the hood, you know, right. but, um, that wasn't the life, man. I always tell people, most people living that lifestyle don't want to live that lifestyle. It's not, they, they feel like it's their only option for the most part. Like it's been programmed into them. Like this is what you do if you live in this type of situation and you want to get out of this environment. And man, long story short, my heart was always driven to create something different for my life, but I had a lot of pain. And I thought, you know, I want to get married. I want to have kids. I always wanted to be a dad, mm -hmm. you know, but I wanted to give my kids the things that I never had. And so that led me to getting married early, got married when I was 21. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a lot of ways, we bonded through our traumas because we had both experienced trauma around the same ages. And a lot of that stuff started coming up in our relationship. So another unhealthy environment. And that unhealthy environment eventually led me to the end of myself where I ended up at the age of 23, putting a gun to my head and uh, sitting in my car two o'clock in the morning, I pulled the trigger and the gun misfired. And, you know, I always tell people, even though the literal bullet didn't fire that night, a conscious one did because, you know, and I'm fast forwarding through this. Of course, there's a series of events, but one of the greatest epiphanies I had that night was that I wasn't where I was because of what happened to me. I was where I was because of how I chose to respond, respond yeah. to what happened to me. And even not growing up around personal professional development, that was non-existent in my life. That one epiphany empowered me because I realized like, even though I couldn't articulate it the way I can now, I realized at that point in my life that if I had the power to create the mess of a life that I hated, mm -hmm. how much more power did I really have if I started living like I gave a damn about myself? Right. Not about everybody else, about Princeton. Because I'm, I'm ready to kill myself because of things that my environment and that people and these different circumstances have, have put up, uh, imposed onto me. You know, but what if I started making different decisions started talking to different people, started educating myself, started getting in, into different environments, started having different conversations, starting with myself. Right. In all the areas that I had been challenged, that I felt defeated in at one point, if I could master me and how I chose to respond to me, then everything outside of me would begin to change. It would have no choice but to change mm -hmm. because that version of Princeton and this version of Princeton that had nothing but possibility in front of him were two completely different versions of self. And that week, man, I quit drinking cold turkey. I quit using drugs cold turkey. I walked away from gangs and I isolated myself for a whole year. And I grew up in the Bible Belt of Virginia, so I didn't really mm -hmm. understand what was happening at that time. You know, like, I never even really liked church as a kid. Like, I used to tell people when I was really little, like, I was a drug baby. I got drugged to church. Wasn't really there because I wanted to be there. It was just like, that's what you do. Like, right. Southern Baptist, hellfire and brimstone every Sunday. You going mm. to hell. You going to hell for waking up today. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's literally what it was <laughs> like, man. But, you know, 
I tell people I started there and I didn't still didn't go back to a church, but I was so hungry for wisdom at that point. And I didn't know about personal professional development again. So only thing I really knew was the Bible. And so for an entire year, I read the Bible from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And what I was ultimately looking for were people who had had experiences like mine. Like right. they had this boom, what we typically call the coming to Jesus moment, that moment when everything pivots. You realize that something in your life, if not everything in your life, is about to change if you choose this path. And I realized there were so many people who had very similar moments just like me. Like you can either do this or you can do this. No matter what, which path you take, you have the power to create whatever reality you want, one that you hate or one that you love. Mm. But in order to achieve the one that you love, you're going to have to love yourself so deeply that you refuse to accept anything that's not in alignment with the love. You refuse to accept weak relationships. You, you refuse to accept weak conversations. You refuse to accept failure as an opportunity because failure only happens when you stop and you gotta love yourself enough never to stop. And so I'm just watching all these things and this is why I tell people like, even though I grew through that, fast forward, I became a pastor, went back to school, got a bachelor's in biblical studies, Eastern religion and pastor for five years, and then realize just even within the scope of religion, people are so lost in the dogma and all the different rituals and beliefs, and there's over 3,000 denominations reading the same book, right. and we wonder why, like, that's confusion, and it's because people, whether you're talking religion, spirituality, personal professional development, people hear things based on what appeases them, but they never truly do the inner work, and so when I saw that as a pastor, and when I decided to step down, I was like, I want to be the example of what it looks like to truly master my life. Because if I can master every aspect of my life in which I once struggled, mm -hmm. with every one thing that I had, had experienced, there's at least a million people out there that I can now impact. And I can be the, the, the reason why they can't use excuses anymore. Right. But first, I have to stop being my own excuse. And so that's ultimately where the journey began. And that was over almost 21 years ago now. So 21 years in the space, and you've um, been developing your program. You've been, you know, going out and touching lives. But what's the first thing that you notice is the biggest uh, issue with people? Like when they, they, and I don't want to say issue as the word issue, like people have issues, but as in what do you think people are dealing with the most? I think what people are dealing with the most is loss of identity. And that starts when we're children. We are programmed you know, you watch a child, like I always say my kids are my greatest teachers because of stuff like this. I have six amazing kids. Mm. Beautiful. My kids are my best six friends. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. So ultimately I have five from my first marriage. I was married. We stayed together for 13 years. Mm. And then I have one by previous relationship. And that's my two-year-old, soon to be three-year-old, you know, mm. but all my kids, man, they're not all biological, but they're all my babies. I raised all of them. But my kids taught me something, man. Like when you watch children before the world gets, gets a hold of them, all they know is possibility. Every day is an adventure. Every day is something, something new. Mm -hmm. They fall down, bump their knee, whatever. They cry, get up, dust it off. They might cry for a little bit and they will go right back to what they were trying to do, whether it was climbing a tree, jumping off the porch. Like you tell them not to do it. Like they're going to keep trying to do it. Or you walk up to a kid, you know, three, four, five years old, and he says, I'm going to be an astronaut. It doesn't matter how many times you tell him, no, you're not. Like, no, you're not. Like, he's going to say, I'm going to be an astronaut. And it doesn't matter what you say to them because they believe with this infinite amount of possibility before they go to school or before mom, tell, mom and dad tells them, you know, what's beautiful, what's ugly, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. Then you go to this educational system and then it's grading you on this, this, this scale that tells you if you get A's, you're a good boy and good girl. And if you get F's, you're a bad boy and you're bad girl you're worthless to society you're not going to be good enough you're not smart and so all of these things begin to program you and little by little you begin to fall into this lie this dream of competition you lose your identity seeking an idea externally at a very early age you know high school I want to be popular I want to be the jock I want to be the cheerleader you know, nerds are unworthy. You know, they they don't deserve relationships. Like, oh, they're geeks, whatever. But then those are the same people that own the companies that you jocks end up working for if you even get grades high enough to graduate a college to go right. or you educate yourself enough to work for them. Mm. 
the system has flipped us, man. And so I'd say the biggest struggle that people has, the big, the biggest challenge that they have is loss of identity, loss of self. And that's why I always say, before you go and take all these other classes and these courses, self-mastery is the most challenging journey you will ever take because it's you facing you and probably in most cases, you meeting you mm -hmm. for the first time in a long time. That's an interesting concept. So, I mean, um, you say that uh, after that day, you know, everything changed for you. Mm -hmm. If you could create everything to be um, that messed up in, in your, your situation, then you can also reverse that and you can also be that powerful, mm -hmm. right? So what is it that, um, what were the changes that you had to start making when you started going down the path of self-mastery? Ma self oh man, one of the first and most important changes that I had to start making was extreme accountability. Mm -hmm. Extreme accountability. Because nobody was gonna come and live my life for me. Nobody was gonna come and open the door and nobody was gonna pat me on the back when things got tough. You know, like I had to figure it out and I had to ask myself every day, Princeton, do you love you enough? to quit doing this or to develop these new habits or to read these books. And I really got focused on the next phase was not only self, self accountability and radical accountability, education. I started going to Barnes and Noble. Like nowadays you can Google, Google how to do, or you can YouTube how to do. Back in the day, we didn't have that. So we literally had to read books, right? you know, and no audible, audible didn't exist, you know? And so I would literally go to Barnes and Noble and I've read books on every day. I'd read anywhere from five to 15 hours a day. There were days where I finished entire books in days. Right. And I would write down. And it was so crazy because when I would go, I would study books on philosophy, human design, human motivations, religion, spirituality, metaphysics, business development, communication, like anything that I thought I would have to develop in, mm -hmm. in order to get a message out, in order to truly impact people. Right. You know, I wanted to understand the way we, we think as humans. Why do we process information we, the way that we do? Why do emotions, which are nothing more than energy in motion based on thoughts, why do the, the feelings control us when we are the ones who have the power over what we think? Right. Because how I think is, is going to determine how I feel. A lot of people say, well, this made me feel that way. No, your thoughts and your projections of those thoughts made you feel that way because that's what you put your energy behind. So I do have a question about that. If you're, mm -hmm. so look at today, right? Like a lot of people, um, I'm sure this is a huge topic for you. Anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. um, all of these type of related uh, events like in people's lives that they hold on to, right? Like what is it, um, like what, what do you tell people when they're dealing with that? Like I, they don't have a, a way out, right? They're thinking right. like I'm, stuck and I'm uh, my life is the way it is I don't know what to do like what do you what is your what is your response because I'm sure you get that question a lot I do get that question a lot and I've been there you know I wouldn't have tried to kill myself if I wasn't there like I think a lot of people the main thing we have to understand about depression even when I work with clients who've dealt with it in the past it's like depression didn't happen overnight it happened over time hmm. initially you just have negative thoughts but then you stop moving, you stop creating, you stop doing anything positive, and all you have is the negative thoughts. Right. And then those negative thoughts are gonna drive you into more negative situations because at, once the negative thoughts come, then you're gonna get angry, you're gonna get sad, you're gonna get bitter, you're gonna get resentful, you know, and you become the victim of your own life. Mm -hmm. And so in that space of depression, you know, I was on medication for ADD, ADHD, from the time I was in first grade until the time I was in seventh grade. And that's when I took myself off of it because I didn't like the way it made me feel. I was on medication for depression, you know, two years before I graduated high school. I didn't like the way it made me feel. It was like something in me knew, like this wasn't going to solve the problem. Right. It was only going to mask it. And so whenever I talk to people, the first thing that I do is I help them get to the root of the problem because a lot of the things that we complain about are not the problems. They're symptoms of a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not happy, you know, I'm miserable, you know, I just don't feel motivated. Those are symptoms. Those are not problems. Right. Oh, my relationship didn't work out. Even that's a symptom. It's not the problem. You know, and so a lot of the times the reason we get stuck is be, we get stuck in the branches of the tree and we never learn how to come back to the root. And what is the root? You. At the end of the day, I am always the common denominator in any aspect of my life. I always say you're the root to the tree of your life. If you don't like the fruit developing in the branches, 
you got to go back to the root. What are you planting yourself in? What types of conversations are you having? What are you feeding your mind? What are you feeding your heart? You know, what actions are you taking every single day? Do those actions bring you peace? Do those actions bring you joy? Do those actions make you feel more loved and, and empowered in your life? Or do you binge watch Netflix all day? Mm -hmm. Do you sit around and talk to people who don't have any passion for doing anything with their life? Are you sitting in the same circumstances that you said five years ago that you were going to get out of, but you never took the steps forward? So as a result, you feel like you are stuck when stuck is nothing more than an illusion. Stuck, mm -hmm. stuck. The idea of being stuck is, an, is, is just that. It's an idea. Right. Stuck is what happens simply when you stop moving because you stay so familiar in this comfortable misery that you have chosen that you think that you can't move out of it. Mm -hmm. You're not stuck. You've just chosen not to live. And so that's when depression really sets in. It's in that place of stuck. But again, it happened over time. So when I start talking to people, I walk them back to the point where they felt the most despair. And then we have to walk back from there. And ultimately, my, my goal is to walk them back to themselves, back to the point where before they blamed the world, back right. to the point before they blamed the relationship, back to the point where they really had the power, you, they felt like they had the power to choose. Because ultimately, if I can get you back to that point, you'll realize that power never left you. You just stop using it. And that's an interesting point because, like, you don't, you don't actually don't think about that on a daily basis. Like, I don't think about like, oh, there was a point at which I wasn't having uh, such a high level of anxiety. You know, I told myself if I want to be a high performer, I have to have high anxiety, right? But it doesn't mean that it's actually true mm -hmm. because there's a point at which you're enjoying something, you're you're a kid, you're running and jumping on something, and you know, you you don't get anxiety about falling off the slide because you didn't fall off of it yet. Once you do, it's how you process that moment that tell, tells you or teaches you how to move forward from that point, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, what is it? Um, so, I mean, yeah, what's, what's your um, thoughts about anxiety as well, not just specifically depression? Mm, anxiety. So you hit a great point there, and so I'm glad you kind of segued into that. You know, as children, again, you said running and jumping off of a sliding board, jumping off the high branch of a tree. Like, we don't have anxiety. It's exciting. Yeah. And it's very important to pay attention to that because the same feeling you get as a kid when you were excited to do something is the same feeling you call anxiety now. Mm. The difference is there's this little one word that now activates when you go to do something you've never been that you've never done before. Because you have lived a long enough life and you have fallen many times. Mm. You've been lied to many times. You've been manipulated many times. You've been hurt many times by different situations and circumstances. Now, when your spirit lights up to go do something new, you have evidence that you fail back here. You have evidence that when you tried something new back here, it hurt. You have evidence that you thought you could trust people back here ended up being that you couldn't trust them. You have evidence that when you said you were gonna get in sh the best shape of your life, you didn't commit to it, and then you told everybody you were gonna do it, then people laughed at you and they doubted you. You have all this evidence now. And so that excitement, now when we go to step into something new, I always say when your spirit wakes up and it realizes it's time to go into creation mode, we go to step into it and our brain goes into one of two states. It's either going to go into the state of remember when or what if. The remember it when and the what if is what takes that fear zone and turns it into a wall. Because what happens is you go to step into something new. Remember last time you tried to do that and it didn't work out? Remember last time you told people you were going to achieve X, right. Y, and Z and it didn't work out? Right. Remember when you tried your best mm. and everybody laughed at you and it didn't work out? Uh, the thing is... Tomorrow's not promised. And that's one thing that I realized. The night that that gun misfired next to my temple, and this is why I took extreme accountability. From the moment that that gun misfired, I knew that every breath that I breathed was a gift. It wasn't just an idea. You know, everybody says, oh, tomorrow's not promised. Tomorrow's not promised. I take it a step further and say, your next breath isn't promised. Right. I could walk out of here today, you know, knock on wood in this chair. I mean, I could walk out of here today, you know, and God forbid I get hit by a car. I get jacked, whatever, anything can have, I have a heart attack. I don't know what's going to happen from one moment to the next. So I don't have time to be concerned. You know, I'm too busy out here kicking ass and taking names. Yeah. 
You know, and, and when I look at my life, you know, I had to kick the ass of depression. I had to kick the ass of fear. I had to kick the ass of worry. I had to kick the ass of doubt. I had to kick the ass of all the things that were going to keep me from being the most powerful version of me because the only person that can ever stop you from being the greatest version of you is the version of you that you're not willing to outgrow. Everybody else, like everybody around me could die right now and I still got to choose who Princeton's going to be today. Nobody dictates that to me. So when I see the opportunity, I always tell my clients, you will never be given a vision for something that provision is not available for. Your spirit will never see something as possible for you if it's impossible for you. Right. It's only going to show you what's possible. And that's where the journey of self now becomes active. So when I step into it, the reason we go to remember wins or what ifs is because we haven't experienced that possibility yet. But the only way, because what happens is we go into a state of uncertainty, right? Right. So what we have to do to shift and move forward through the fear is now ask ourselves, what is that version of me doing? Mm -hmm. What is the successful version of me? Like I know you said, you know, you're preparing to fight. You know, what is that con highly conditioned version of you doing that this version of you isn't doing? How are they waking up every morning? What types of conversations? What are they listening to every day when they're getting ready for their workout? What are they putting in their heads? Like that version of you. Right. And bring those things that that version of you is doing into this now moment, because right now is your most powerful moment. How you show up right now is going to create the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. That future you already exists in the current you. Mm -hmm. You just have to bring it here. Right. You know, and so don't let the anxiety or the ideas of failure, because that's all it is. It's a feeling of excitement, but then because of feelings of uncertainty, because of a lack of awareness of or a lack of knowledge around, because of that feeling of uncertainty, we let those what if and remember wins take control. But instead of what if and remember when, I'm only going to focus on the possibility of being until I become. Right. So from this point, yeah, I feel it. So I always tell people fear is my best friend. I love when I feel anxiety. Because that's my spirit saying, it's time to move. Going in the right direction. Yes. Yeah. I'm growing. I'm not comfortable anymore. I don't ever want to feel comfortable. And so let's see, let's say, you know, somebody's listening to this and they're hearing, they're feeling that. They know there's an opportunity. They know there's a chance. They know that there's a path that they can take. They have to be able to take a first step. What do you tell them when they say, you know, because people think, okay, it sounds good, but what's practicality? The practicality behind it is this. As simple as I can be, and this is the thing, like we've gotten so used to like hustle culture and everybody wants the high level tactic. Mm -hmm. I always say focus on putting one foot in front of the other. Life is not about the destination. It's about the journey. It's literally about waking up every single day and asking yourself, what is one thing that I can do today to make my life 1% better? Mm -hmm. Take all the pressure off of yourself that I got to get to this point fast because it's not about perfection it's about progress and the goal of the process is to be able to get to the end of each day and say even though i may not be where i want to be yet today i'm better focus on being better every single day you want to have more joy in your life sit back get a journal write out all the things that you can think of from where you currently are that would truly bring you joy right truly bring you joy what is something you used to do that you stopped doing? Maybe because your last relationship, they didn't like you doing it, and you just kind of put it down by the wayside, but it's something you really loved. Go pick that thing up again. What is something you, you stopped doing because people told you you would never be successful at it, but it's something you really loved? Right. The problem with progressing is that we stop doing things that we love to become people or to become like people who have the lifestyles that the world wants to see. Mm -hmm. But most of those people are not happy. Most of those people wake up every single day trying to maintain an image because their image through ego is being validated. Right. But if the validation stops, who the hell are they? Mm -hmm. if, if Instagram and social media disappeared right now, half the people that people are talking about would disappear. Nobody would be talking about them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and I always say, like, get off of social media. Stop paying attention to what everybody else is doing. Stop paying attention to a highlight reel and start living a life that's real. Yeah. Wake up every single day and ask yourself, what's the best version of me that I can be today? Okay, yesterday I may have been a little more negative. Maybe I sat around long. Okay, today I'm going to go for a walk. Maybe you're trying to get in a better shape. 
Go for a walk. Go to the gym, walk on the treadmill. Just do a mile. Don't try to make yourself feel like I got to do all these extra workouts and I got to, you know, be sore as hell for like the next week. Like little, they call them Kaizen steps. It's a little incremental steps because a lot of times people want to take these big steps. Now, don't get me wrong. There are points in your journey where big steps happen because you took so many little steps. But you start developing the habits of taking the little steps that you don't even realize you're taking the little steps anymore. So that's why it looks like a big step happened. It's that what was once a challenge became first nature. You know, and so make being better every single day first nature. If people say, I can't read. I always tell people, read a book. Find a book. And if you need to know of books to read, reach out to me on social media. You know, reach out to mentors. Reach out to people like you. Like, Ask questions. Stop sitting around trying to figure it out on your own. We are not designed to do it on our own. The human race was designed to connect, to unify. And the reason we have so many problems, the reason depression is what it is, anxiety is what it is, is because we've stopped loving each other. And at the si in the simplest way possible, if you want to change your life, again, love is the only way to change your life. And I don't mean love as an emotion. I mean love as a state of being. Right. Meaning I have this tenacious care and awareness for my life that I do not care if everyone around me leaves me right now. I'm going to be the best version of me regardless because they didn't come into this world with me and they are not going out of this world with me. I came into this world naked. I'm going out naked. But what I do know is my cup is going to be empty when I'm gone. I'm not leaving anything left on the table. Live your life. Like, what's the point of living if you're going to spend your entire life surviving? Right. And the reason we get stuck in anxiety and depression and all these things is because we're just surviving our life. We're not truly living our lives. Mm -hmm. We've forgotten how to because, again, as I said in the beginning, we've lost our identity. And when you get past struggling with who you think you are or who you think you need to be and you get back to the awareness of self, the fact that you are a divine spiritual creator, an energetic being with the power to create anything you, this body is just that, it's a body, it's a vessel. This body's gonna die one day. It's gonna be gone, back to the dirt. But I always say, you know, if I say I am thinking, it's not my brain saying I am thinking. It is the conscious awareness that thought is happening, having the realization of thought. I am not the body. I am not Princeton. Princeton is just an idea. My mom and dad, they have an idea of Princeton. You have an idea of Princeton. Everybody in this room has an idea of Princeton. The world has an idea of Princeton, those who've met him. But every day I wake up, I say Princeton's going to be who the hell I say Princeton's going to be based on where I want to take Princeton today. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about yesterday. I'm not worried about who might show up and who might leave. I'm not, I don't have time because every breath is a gift. So get back to you. Get back to love. Start educating yourself in the areas that serve you or serve your vision. Start visualizing and writing down what the future version of you actually looks like, the actions that they're taking, and bring that into the current moment and ask yourself, how can you start implementing it today? Mm -hmm. And then once you start doing that, ask yourself, how can I love myself in a way that I didn't love myself yesterday? How can I love myself and remove the expectations of other people to love me? Because a lot of people feel like they're not worthy of love because they've never truly learned to love themselves. Because when you love yourself, I don't care if you love me. I don't care if anybody, I love me. Right. And that's the greatest damn feeling ever to wake up every single day and say, I love me. But because I love me so much, what that challenges me to do is see how much more you you're You can worth. love yourself, yeah. Yeah, so now I can love you more. The more deeply I love myself, the more deeply I can love the people I serve. And so um, bringing this to relationships, mm -hmm. I mean, that's got to be a huge one right now. I'm going to open, the, Go open ahead, up the open up the Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's your what's your viewpoint on on the relationships and self-love? Oh, man, I don't believe you can truly love someone else until you truly love yourself. I think. I'll say this at this point in my life. Self-mastery, again, relationship is just a branch to the tree, but I'm still the root. I'm still down here. If my relationships are off, it's because some aspect of me is off. If my finances are off, because I say in all the branches, there are relationships. I have a relationship to money. I have a relationship to people. I have a relationship to significant others. I have a relationship to my mental health, my emotional health. 
my spiritual health, my physical well-being, they're all relationships. And so I see a personal relationship with a significant other the same way I see every other relationship. It comes back to the root. Okay, if I expect you to give in areas where I have not given, guess what? I can't pull from an empty account. You know, I can't keep pouring out of an empty cup when I'm not being filled. You know, and so if I want to feel that relationship, well, number one, let me say this. I've evolved past the point of wanting a simple relationship. For me now, it's about partnership. And I believe that when we talk about partnership, if we look at it from a perspective of business, I'm not going into a business deal working towards a vision. Excuse me. I'm not going into a business deal or working to create a vision with someone who can't see the full vision. I'm not going to commit my time and my energy if I don't understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. I'm not going to bring part of the vision to the table and then complain when you don't see the whole vision. Which means if I'm going to be in a partnership, see, you can have a relationship with anyone. You can have a relationship with someone just because they like the color red on your shirt. Mm. You can have a relationship with someone because they like the same music as you. But on the inside, they're vindictive and evil, and they hide it because we like the same music. So why do you think that that relationships today are struggling so much? (laughs) Again, people don't love themselves. They are caught up in trying to be like the Joneses and everything they see on social media. And again, people don't love themselves. Like, I need you to validate how I feel about me because I'm not willing to address myself. Right. Like, I don't love myself. And so in all the empty voids in the areas where I have not learned to love myself, I need you to feel that for me. I need you to make me happy about how I feel with you because I'm not happy with myself. Right. It all, like, I don't care what we talk about. It all comes back to you. Every single thing. People out here, man, they're just imbalanced. Like, they have no balance. Like I always say, the three foundational stones of self-mastery are mind, body, soul. If any one of those are out of alignment, let alone all of them, every aspect of your life or some aspect of your life is going to be out of alignment. One of the first out things that are going to be out of alignment, if any one of those foundational stones are out of alignment, is going to be your relationship. Because all of your relationships, to some degree, are a reflection of you. Mm-hmm. You chose that person. You chose not to be honest. You chose to wear a mask and not show your emotions from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You chose not to tell the truth about what you were really struggling with and what you never dealt with that happened to you when you were a kid. You chose to hide and put up all the secret doors. And so now you meet someone and then you wonder why it doesn't evolve. You wonder why it doesn't grow. It's because both of you are living a lie to one another because she showed up. And wasn't honest about her emotional state. She showed up with areas that were unhealed and that she was just playing a victim in. She showed up still wishing she was with that other person, but putting on a mask like she was over it and everything is okay. Like, everybody's wearing a mask. They got a mask for their friends, a mask for their significant other, a mask for their family. Why? Because they haven't healed. Mm -hmm. They haven't gotten back to that inner child within themselves and learned to love it from the root and say, you are worth everything that you desire. But first, you have to know that the one thing that makes you special is that you are an original blueprint. There will never be another you that you can, that can do what you can do like you can do it. Your life is a miracle in and of itself. But we've stopped being miracles and we've started being copies of copies. Mm-hmm. And so now you got a bunch of copies of copies all running around as smorgasbords of emotions and ideas and perspectives and everybody's super and hyper emotional and this is toxic and that's toxic. No, you're blind. It's not that they're toxic. They are spirits on a journey having different human experiences. And now you're judging them because you don't understand their experience, primarily because you don't understand your own. So you validate your own ego and you puff yourself up to try to make yourself seem higher than them. When really, at the end of the day, someone else looks like me looks at that and I see ignorance. Mm -hmm. You are not wise. You're all foolish. You're all the blind leading the blind and you're all falling in the ditch. And I'm just sitting up here looking at you like the road's right here. Get back to you. Stop focusing on them. Every day I wake up, I don't need to lie to anybody. I don't need to put on a mask. Like, I love my freaking life, man. And I I got my clients to that same space. Don't you want to live a life that you can say is 100% yours? Because the reasons relationships and businesses and the infrastructure of the government and the world economy and all these things are, are, are jacked up is because everybody's living behind a mask. Right. Everybody's stuck behind a lie. 
And I feel like media keeps us stuck behind that lie. Because if we were to ever wake up and see how jacked up things were, and if we were to ever wake up and realize that the only reason those systems have the power that they have or the relationships that have, have had the control over us, that they've had the control over us, the only reason they have that power is because we give them the power. But the moment I take my power back and I say, nope, that doesn't align with me. Nope, I'm not going to argue with you. That's not worth my time. Nope, that brings my energy down. I don't feel joy. That doesn't give me peace in my life. You know, you having that much control over how I respond to things. Nope. I feel like you're the thermometer in my life. It's time for me to take my control back. So how do you how do you suggest people do that in simple steps? In simple steps, man, <laughs> this is the thing. Again, this is why I say self-mastery is the toughest journey you're going to ever, ever have. It's a reason why they're called practices. So, again, going back to looking at your life, being completely honest. One thing that I have my clients do in the beginning is, I'll write that on three pieces of paper or a piece of paper split and then on the back, I have the first thing I have them write is my life as it is. All the good, the challenging, you know, all the, the whole smorgasbord of what's happening in your life as it is. And then on the other side, I'll have them write my life as I desire it to be from where I can see it now. Mm -hmm. What are some changes you would make right now? What are some changes you would like to see happening in your life right now? Then on the bottom or on the last piece of paper, I'll have them write out goals to achieve what they say on this side. But I don't stop it there. Because when we write out our goals, a lot of the times what we do is we just write the goal. But I'll say don't just write the goal for what you're going to achieve. Write out the steps that are required to achieve each one of those goals. You know? You want to be in the best shape of your life. What does that look like? Okay, I want to I want to weigh X amount of weight. I want to have X amount of percentage body fat. Okay, what type of diet am I going to have to dial in in order to get to that point? Right. Okay, how many times do I need to go to the gym? How much cardio do I need to need to get in? You know, mm -hmm. and write all of those things down and then follow it. The reason most people never achieve their goals to mastering or changing their life is because they don't do this. They write the goal. But because they don't see the steps to achieving the goal, they're like a leaf blowing in the wind. And right. they're just kind of all over the place. But when you learn to write your goals down, whether it's I want to be more emotional, emotionally stable, okay, what's one thing that I can do every day or maybe three times a week to create a more, a more conducive emotional state for my life? Okay, what are the things that I love? Write down the things that you love. But don't just write down the things that you love. Write down times during the week that you can actually do those things. Who would be someone that you would like to invite with you to go and do those things? Because, mm -hmm. again, connection is important. Connection is currency. It's going to create more flow of that same energy in your life. Right. You know, but long story short, you can do this with each one of the goals. Don't just write the goal down. Write down what is required or what are the steps to achieving that goal. And what this is going to do, it's going to give you a compass for every day. So every day you wake up, if you do not achieve this goal, don't cry about it. Don't cry. Like, like I tell my clients, don't complain about the results you don't get from the work you don't do. Right. Because at the end of the day, you're the root to the tree. Nobody's going to come and do it for you. But write your goals down. And you can reach out to me on Facebook, you know, anybody or Instagram, you know, reach out to me and I'll, I'll give you a sheet. If you don't even know how to think that how to write that on a piece of paper by yourself, I'll give you a worksheet. You just fill it out. I'll give it to you for free. But <clears throat> yeah, man, set solid goals. Write down the steps of those goals take action every day. Don't be hard on yourself and celebrate the wins. Celebrate. If you didn't get five steps done in the goal, but you got one, celebrate at the end of that day because today you did something you didn't do yesterday. Stop right. beating yourself up so much. You know, because again, it comes back to loving the process. Like if you got better today, focus on the areas that you got better, not the areas that you, that you didn't grow. Again, a lot of times we don't know what questions to ask or even when we're hiring a coach or we want to take a class or go to an event, we write our goal. We watch these funnels and all the stuff come up on, you know, Instagram and it's like, oh man, like that's a goal that I want to hit. But the reason it's important, another reason it's important to write the goals and the steps to the goals is because you're going to realize that in those steps, you're also going to have questions. Mm -hmm. So now when you look at books or you go to events, you're going to know what questions to ask based on how to reach that goal. It's not just, hey, I want to do this. You and a million other people want to do that. Right. How do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. Well, 
these are the levels to my goals. These are the steps that I have right now. But in these areas, I need to develop more education. So that's why I took this course. So my question for you today is, in order for me to achieve this step of this goal, whatever that is, what is the first step I must take in order to take this step? See, now you're getting granular in achieving your goals as opposed to the goal being so big and monumental. Like when you can break it down into those smaller steps, it makes it a lot easier to achieve. You know, I can wake up like there's no rush in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't need to hustle, hustle, hustle. I just need to be happy. That's it. That's my only goal. Every day I wake up, I want to be happy. Mm. I want to, or rather, I want to have joy because happiness is an emotion. I might have a negative thought that's not a happy thought that creates a negative feeling in my body. But because my state of joy, my state of being is always in joy or love, it's like, okay, I'm going to observe it. It doesn't take control of me. It's like, wow, that thought's there. I set these goals. Okay, what did I say I was going to achieve today? <sighs> I'm going to release it now. All right, what's the first step? And if that's the only step I take, that was a hell of a win because it takes less than a millisecond for one negative thought to, come a, to become a mirage mm -hmm. of thoughts. Like it literally becomes like the moment you take a neck or you have a negative thought, imagine the snowball effect happening. All the negative thoughts that start swirling around in your, in your conscious brain are now attacking that one thought. But, so is, is that what you say most, or you would say most people are dealing with mm -hmm. the most? Yeah, because they, they give the thoughts power. You know, even when I meditate, you know, I slow down. A lot of times people say meditation is about quieting the brain. And I always say meditation is about observing the brain. Mm -hmm. You know, the brain and the mind are two completely different things. The brain is a computer system that's been programmed since you were a kid. You know, every experience you've ever had Every really strong negative and every really strong positive has created programs that this brain fires off of. And just like a computer system, the brain, the computer, can only run programs or files based on the programs in the computer. And so this is why sometimes you got to defrag the brain. You got to observe, why is this program running? Hmm, what does this program go back to? When did I start getting so angry about stuff like this? When did I start making this matter to me? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Clearly, this program is running that's pulling these files. What would be a more conducive program for me now? Hmm. How about a program of forgiveness? Okay, I can't go back to change all of these things back here. So in this moment, I breathe in this moment and I release it. In this moment, it no longer exists. Now, this is the practice part because those things will still come back up because of all the files running. There's always going to be something that you remember from something else that happened or it mirrors something that's similar to things that have happened. So as those things happen every day, I give myself time to be in the space of awareness, meaning I am consciously observing thoughts, not just letting thoughts run. And like when people respond a certain way, you hear people say, this is just how I am. This is just who I am. No, that's how you've programmed yourself to be. Mm -hmm. And if you just say, this is who I am, this is how I am. What you're saying is you've given this personified identity, uh, prof excuse me, You've given this personified idea of self an identity now, mm -hmm. which makes it solid. It makes it concrete. But if I realize that I am formless, I'm an anomaly. The moment you think you know me is the moment you realize you don't know me at all because every day I become a new version of me. You know, I took a, a program called Landmark Education. Yeah. And uh, uh, actually one of the things that was really wild, and when we got this, it was a, a really big um, insight for us, was that your, personal your personality is actually your defense mechanism that's been developed over the course of your life to reaction of situations you've been in, mm -hmm. right? Your personality, think about that, personality, personality. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're basically personifying and creating barriers for yourself to say, oh, I'm just a hyper person. I'm just a mellow person. I'm just a talkative person. I'm a very <laughs> quiet person. Like I used to tell myself I wasn't a tech person. All I did was switch that to I am a tech person because I grew up in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And that was incredible for me because I made more money making that changing that one statement than anything else in my life. Mm -hmm. Like I know it's, it's just what's you know important today, but whatever's relevant to you, if you can change that, you know, if you can change your personality, right? Like we're not stuck the way we are, mm -hmm. right? 
And that's like, I think so important. I think that's what you remind me of. Like you tell, you say these things that make me think like, these are the things that people have in the back of their heads that they haven't thought about in a long time. Right. And we forget they ever exist. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the personal personality or the personal reality becomes the main reality yeah. and the spirit reality, the spiritual reality. Cause I always say there's a difference between the personality and spirituality. Mm -hmm. The person is the idea that I create. The spirit is what I am. So anything that is possible, number one, all things are possible. Right. If we believe, you know, if a man, as a man thinketh, so that man becomes. So again, switching your I am statements, I'm glad you brought that up because your I am statements are the most powerful statements you can ever make. Mm -hmm. Like you'll never hear me say I'm weak. You'll never hear me say I can't. I'm not good enough. I'm struggling. But you will hear me say, I am powerful beyond measure. I am a conscious creator with the ability to manifest whatever it is I desire to manifest in this world. I am one of the greatest leaders in this time that will create change and impact millions and millions of people, not just in my lifetime, but when I die. Like, I say things like that because I know it's possible. I've had visions of it happening. The only reason people don't talk about like that, talk about things like that is because they're afraid that people are going to laugh at them because the truth is there's not, they're not truly believing in themselves. Right. And it takes some practice because I, I've been doing this and I've been running this and I've had thoughts like constantly running through, you can see them go through multiple episodes, thoughts in my head, what I'm dealing with. And it's just those I am statements and pushing myself to say like, I will make an impact with this podcast. I will mm -hmm. affect positive change. If people are on their phones, I'm going to put the message in front of you. Right. Because you're not, where are you going now? You're, you're on your phone. Right. Like, and I, I, that's why I like, you know, that's why I like TikTok rather than dislike it because I'm looking at what I can use it for, for good. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm trying to combat all of the things that I've ever experienced negatively by putting out more positive in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and that's, that's a part of, um, purpose. Like, I think that's for me developing a sense of purpose, which I think is so important to like keeping you up and keeping you going every day. I love that. And purpose is key. The reason, again, most people are miserable. It's because they haven't found their purpose. And I have people ask me all the time, how do I find my purpose? And I said, well, first, you got to understand purpose is rooted in service. Service is rooted in love. But you'll never find your ability to serve until you learn to love, starting with yourself. Because, see, if you show up every single day, we've all been given gifts. We've all been given skills. And we can develop beyond the ones that we are aware of. There are an infinite number of gifts and an infinite number of realities in front of us at any given time. Mm. The problem is the personality, the personal reality, we make it so real that we stop believing there's an infinite number of us's that are possible. Right. In this moment. That's huge. Like there's an infinite number of yous. Like you literally could t today choose a completely different path. And if you stay on it long enough, you, cr you manifest an entirely new reality. Right. So again, coming back to loving yourself, like, we're all spirits on a journey, having different human experiences. I don't compare my human experience to, to anyone else's. I look at what I have had the opportunity to grow through. I don't say go through anymore, mm. but I look at what I've had an opportunity to grow through on my spiritual journey, the awareness, the challenges, the fears faced, the doubting moments, the moments where I wanted to give up, the abuse, the molestation, the depression, the gang, seeing people close to me get shot right next to me. Like I look at all these things and I'm at a place in my life where I can say, thank you. Thank you for teaching me to be grateful. Thank you for teaching me to have peace. Mm -hmm. Thank you for teaching me to believe that anything is possible. Because if I could go from being this malicious person who at one point in my life would curve dudes, like literally stump their heads on curve. Like I, I literally had no remorse. I, was, I used to say, I hate people. I hate the world. Like I literally didn't care. To being this person loving myself. It all started there. It didn't start with, and I'm so glad that I didn't focus on building big business and let me sell you this course and that yeah. course. For the first 12 years, I didn't charge people for coaching because I always said, I want to have money, but I never want money to have me. Mm -hmm. I do this because I purposely am driven 
to create impact in the world. And I never want people to be able to look at my life and say, oh, he's just doing it for the money. Because you look at most of the people out there, what do people say? Oh, it's all about the money. Why? Because they keep pulling people into these systems. And this is an area where I'm trying to disrupt the coaching industry. I work with Tony Robbins, Dean Graziosi, Pat Quinn, Pete Vargas, and a lot of other big names in the industry. Some of my mentors were Zig Ziglar, Dr. Wayne Dyer, Les Brown, Miles Monroe. Like these are people that I studied under you know, but I also studied Socrates, Plato, like philosophers and all these great people. And I realized that there is a stark difference between the leaders of today and the leaders of then. The leaders of today lead you by your pain. The leaders of then led you by purpose. It's like they, they attach to what challenge are you having into your, in your life today? Right. When I talk to people, no. Do you know how freaking powerful you are? Mm. I get that where you are right now, you feel like it's not possible. I get that you've been playing it weak and you've been doing it halfway, but there is a spirit in you crying to get out. And the reason you're not happy is because that spirit that has been speaking to you for the past five years has been shaking you to your core. And when you show up to everybody else, you're smiling during the day, but that spirit is having you in tears Can in the middle right of the night. Too? Can you say it right there too? <laughs> say it to them, dude. He's say like, it to stop them. saying it to me. Say it to them, dude. <laughs> But it's real. It's real. You know, like, that's how I talk to people. Like, my babe over there, like, that's, she'll tell you, like, I, <laughs> she hasn't really seen me get like that yet. But no, man, like, stop paying attention to all this fear mongering that a lot of the coaches, a lot of these speakers, a lot of these high level individuals who the only reason they look high level is because of social media and they got more money than you and so they can put themselves out there more doesn't mean that they have more impact than you because i can tell you right now and this is not an ego boost this is an awareness of what's fact it doesn't matter what stage you put me on the journey that i've had to take is journeys that they have never had to take the one thing they will never be is this version of me because there will never be a version of me that's more powerful than what i can be tomorrow and they don't have the vision for what that can be see I own me and see when you get afraid to start speaking like that see because when you know what you are beyond who you think you are that's when change happens that's when change happens because people might tell you oh you think you're all that you think you're all that no I'm just letting my light shine and if it's too bright for you put some sunglasses on because it's only getting brighter hey confidence man that's that <laughs> Love and confidence. Every time you're in the room, dude, I get more confident. So you're doing something right. <laughs> and I get more sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, um, I want to give you one last, uh, you know, um, opportunity while we're here to mm -hmm. give a couple of, uh, um, I mean, t t tell us what you're up to. Tell us what you're doing and um, give your, you know, a message of encouragement, which I think you already had plenty of. Yeah, man. But Always. Um, so yeah, I have my two books, Awakening Your Inner Master, The Journey of Self-Mastery. That's my bestseller um, on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Then I have my new book, um, Speaker of Truth, or Warrior of Love, Speaker of Truth. That's a decade anthology. So that's one of those books you just open up to any area and it's going to just speak to your soul. That truth of you, the power of you. Um, Right now, man, really just focusing on my live events. We're getting ready to launch the Legacy Builder Elite here in Arizona. And we're going to be hosting monthly workshops, live events, where we're going to be diving into a lot of the tactical and tangible stuff. But more than anything for me, it's about leading a community. Because mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of big leaders, they get to this point where it's like, it's almost like they're untouchable. You know, but the only way you should ever get to a point where you're untouchable is you, if you have replicated the same results in the lives of those closest to you, and they're able to now do the same thing. And I can tell you working at high level, a lot of the coaches that people think are high level coaches are not high level coaches. They're just people who went through the program and they understand how the program work. And so they will hire them and say, hey, now you're one of our world-class coaches. And I'm telling you the people at the top of the top do this. Most of the people who you think when you're going through these programs are high level coaches are not high level coaches. They're just students to the program. And so, that's why I say a lot of them are frauds. They don't really care about the people. At this point, people are nothing more than a number to them. So really fo focusing on my live events and we're prepping for we, nine months from now, we're going to be doing our Mastery Summit 2024 here in Scottsdale. But the other events are just going to be live. We got some virtual stuff going on, but I'm just enjoying life right now, man. And, and focusing on my branding business. I have a branding business too. Yep. We didn't really dive into that, but helping people to understand that you are your brand, not this lie, 
but the truth of you. I wanted to talk to you about that afterwards as well, because I've uh, started to do that as well with the podcast. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put out, um, we're going to help people with brands, help them with their brand image um, and everything like that, because we're building it as well. You're building it as well. We'd love to work together. So um, that's awesome. So I appreciate everybody's thinking, uh, this kicking ass, taking names podcast. We're here with Princeton Clark, and I appreciate it, everybody. And one more thing, real quick, before we sign off, don't go anywhere. My podcast, Evolve Mastery. I got new episodes coming on that as well. All the links will be beneath uh, in the show notes. But love you guys, man. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.